Richard's been, uh, has, has come out in the course of the day, um, very generous to uh, many of us here with his, his time, uh, advice, comments on manuscripts, uh, all of that. Uh, I can't uh, imagine how many times I've called him about uh, a potential clerk, uh, sometimes uh, somebody who has not listed him as a reference, and I want to know from Richard why that is. Um, he's, uh, he's been uh, helpful to me on many occasions. I remember once uh, when I was, I was teaching labor law for five or six years, my first five or six years uh, at Harvard, and um, I wanted to get out of it after a couple of years, but it wasn't possible. Uh, then Archie Cox came back from Washington and decided he didn't want to resume teaching it. And um, I asked him why. I was amused by his answer. He said, well, it's like tax law. Uh, the, the big questions have been, uh, have been answered. Uh, so I passed it on to Richard. I thought he'd find the music. And he first said, Patrick, hey, they haven't even been asked. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's been an inspiring day already, just to be back in, in the presence um, we're going to hear from, uh, we have three papers that are nominally about um, administrative law and regulation, but um, they, and they all are within that broad conception, but they are also each very distinctive and um, could have fit into a number of different uh, categories. We're going to hear first um, from, um, from Jennifer No, who's here at Chicago as a Newberger uh, Family Assistant uh, Professor. Um, she uh, was at, at OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, where I spent uh, some time as well. Uh, that was after uh, the Yale College and, and law school, uh, and after clerking for, um, for Judge Posner and for Justice Breyer. Uh, then we'll hear from Shruti uh, Roger Gopalan, uh, who is an assistant professor of economics at SUNY uh, Purchase. Um, and a fellow at the Classical Liberal Institute. In fact, this particular panel uh, will be uh, a majority affiliated with uh, the Classical Liberal, Liberal Institute at NYU, as is Richard, uh, and our, our, uh, our speakers uh, following uh, Trudy, um, um, who will be, if I get them in the correct order, which I'm trying to do, uh, David, uh, uh, pardon me, multi -dulled. Um, a postdoc in economics at, uh, uh, at NYU on the Classical Liberal Institute. Um, also an Adam Smith Fellow at the Mercatus Institute, which is about, I don't know, 70 or 80 feet from my office at, uh, at George Mason. You ought to come around sometime. Uh, have some uh, and a, uh, as, as a doctor from, uh, from Freiburg. And then finally from Mario Rizzo, uh, at the Classical Liberal Institute and at, uh, at the Economics Department uh, at NYU. I was particularly interested to see in the bio, which you all have in the program, about his, um, his forthcoming book with Jerry O'Driscoll on uh, Austrian economics. Uh, pardon me, not that one, the one after. It's got two coming. Um, this one's with Glenn Whitman, Puppets and Puppet Masters, Rationality, Behavioral Economics, and the New Paternalism. I think the book is, um, is already overdue in that uh, it was needed a few years ago, uh, but we're most welcome now. So we start, uh, Jennifer, where are you? Jennifer. So at lunch, uh, Richard referred to his time as interim dean uh, of our law school here, um, but some of you may not know that Richard has um, much more experience um, in the administration of the University of Chicago, um, including serving in the university's faculty senate. Um, I've also had the privilege of being on multiple committees here at the law school with Richard. And um, on a more personal note, um, I think Richard is uh, somewhat responsible for my um, uh, decision to move in academia. So when I was in Washington, D.C., um, and um, had been offered this incredible opportunity to come to this law school and um, uh, do a fellowship and, and, and uh, make the transition. Um, I was told by my uh, husband and sister-in-law that uh, both of them had attended the lab school with Richard Epstein's children. 
and um, where uh, the, the memories that they have are very ornate um, dining room settings and um, Richard's um, encyclopedic knowledge um, shared at the dinner table. And um, they were uh, very excited and thrilled that I'd get to um, be on the same uh, in the same faculty law, the same law school um, as Richard Epstein. And um, in addition to being familiar with his work, um, I was uh, very uh, thrilled to have that opportunity as well, and indeed have benefited enormously um, as a colleague of his, of his um, uh, and, and sharing that knowledge. Um, and in many of these administrative roles, uh, Richard has certainly observed um, many uh, different forms of organizational governance and structure that undoubtedly have influenced, as he has told me, his thoughts on the organization of the executive branch and other organizations in general. So um, the conference organizers generous, generously um, and graciously allowed me, when agreeing to be a panelist here, to present a piece of a larger work in progress on these themes, which has been immensely influenced by Richard's work. Um, and my hope in doing so was really to have it serve as a springboard um, to talk about Richard's influence on administrative law and the separation of powers uh, more generally. So in my time here, first, I'll just say just a little bit about the larger project, just to contextualize um, Richard's insights on the intersection between executive and corporate power in order to three suggest that while Richard has many reservations about the administrative state, um, I suspect he would agree that properly designed constraints on agency executives may help alleviate many of them. Okay, so just first about this larger project, it's currently titled Agency Constitutions. And the basic claim is that um, administrative agencies, like state governments, like corporations and corporate charters, um, operate under their own constitutions. These constitutions are distinct in form and substance from the federal constitution, though they similarly regulate relationships uh, between their respective members. So specifically, these administrative constitutions, they really exhibit divergent ideas about how to constrain executive power and um, agency executives. And here I'm referring to the chairs, the administrators, the directors, and the secretaries um, of the administrative state. Uh, these constitutions, I claim, are often found in the uh, Subconstitutional Administrative Procedure Act, uh, Reorganization Acts, um, and most commonly in the agency's own organic statutes. And uh, the project basically applies what loosely might be described as a comparative constitutional law lens to taxonomize these various constitutions and problematize uh, these distinctions that are drawn in the case law simply between single-member and multi-member commissions. Uh, and, and accordingly, the, the, the project focuses in particular on these multi-member commissions because these are where the internal separations of power disputes um, most often arise. Okay, so what it does, I collected all these agency constitutions and I'm trying to, to, to categorize them and, and um, reflect more on different choices that have been made in terms of the separation of powers internally to the agency. So to illustrate and motivate, um, consider a dispute that arose uh, with the now defunct um, Interstate Commerce Commission, where basically uh, the duly appointed and confirmed commissioners uh, wanted to um, have the agency's bureaus and offices report to them rather than just to the chair of the Interstate Commerce Commission. And uh, the chairman took umbrage and said, look, I am the statutory executive of the ICC, and um, all of these reports should come to me. That is my executive um, authority. Um, in rejecting this claim, uh, the Comptroller General cited the intent of the ICC's governing constitution. Okay? Uh, basically, it was to abolish the inefficient plural executive in form uh, in which statutory authority was dispersed and to replace it instead with a more unitary executive in the form of the chair. Okay, so hopefully you're all, we're already thinking of the analogies um, in the federal context and the state context to plural executives versus unitary executives. And um, with that rationale, basically the Comptroller General says, therefore, this move by the commissioners to try and centralize reporting authority is illegal my terms, unconstitutional, I want to say. I use it more as a metaphor, really, as, as staking a, a ground. Of course, there's a huge literature about what is and is not constitution. Um, uh, but but it, was, it, was, it was unconstitutional in, in, in one understanding of the idea of what it means to be a constitution. By contrast, uh, consider another controversy, and this is going to be my main motivating example, uh, that erupted between the members of the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. Okay, this is an agency charged with um, investigating hazardous chemical releases, 
And here, the new chair came to power, and he unilaterally decided that the board should not engage in any new investigation. And um, he alone would submit the budget to Congress, effectively setting the board's priorities without consulting any of his fellow commissioners. At issue then was how expansively to interpret the agency's organic statute and its, and its so-called constitution. Okay? And then that, that constitution states, well, look, the chairperson shall be the chief executive officer of the board and shall exercise executive and administrative functions of that board. <clears throat> okay, so the interpretive questions are, well, what does it mean to be a chief executive officer of the board? Uh, what are executive or administrative authorities? Do they imply exclusive <coughs> budget setting and investigatory powers? And so these internal separation, power, separation of powers disputes um, help to motivate these larger interpretive questions that Richard's work can help to shed light upon. Okay, again, what are the inherent executive authorities um, in this so-called chief executive officer of these boards? And are these powers the same for the chairs of other agencies with similar um, constitutions? Okay, so for example, the Federal Communications Commission um, also says that the chair shall be the chief executive officer um, of the commission. By contrast, and you're not meant to be able to read this, it's just showing you these different constitutional constitutional provisions in these organic statutes, including um, the general authority, the appointment power of the chair, the removal power of the chair, the extent to which you can delegate the power, budgetary and spending authorities, okay? And suffice <coughs> simply to say that there is a lot of variation. Okay, so for example, the Securities Exchange Commission chair is not a chief executive officer. Um, he is simply, um, uh, um, authorized to exercise the so-called executive and administrative functions of the commission. Okay, and then I have lots more examples of these. By contrast, the Commodities Future Trading Commission chair is the so-called chief administrative officer of the commission. Okay, is that different? Is that the same as a chief executive officer? Right? Is that exclusive? Is that is that meant to say something different about executive power um, within an agency? So Richard has written extensively and eloquently on the need to understand public law doctrines and interpretive moves against the backdrop of the common law, as we have heard throughout the day. And one of the many contributions of his work, of his work has been to remind us not only the limits of the public law, given the robustness of private orderings, um, but also how to explain how the private law should inform public law as well. Okay. And because he's written about everything under the sun, Richard, of course, has thoughtfully extended this premise to the question of how to understand constitutional executive power by reference to corporate executive power. And I'm going to focus on two of his works in particular. Uh, one is uh, aptly titled Executive Power in Political and Corporate Contexts, um, and the, uh, published in the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law and Optimal Constitutional Structure, uh, which is a, a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Law and Economics. And of course, he draws on many of these ideas as well in many of his other works, including the classical political constitution. Yes, last year. Um, <laughs> so in executive power in political and corporate contexts, um, Richard reflects upon the similarities and differences between corporations and the executive branch. What are some of the similarities? Well. Uh, well, executive branch of separation of powers more generally. So this, as for similarities, he notes that boards of directors, like Congress, are responsible for setting policy. Like Congress, uh, these boards do not need to be in constant session to do their work. CEOs, like presidents, are responsible for carrying out the directives of the board. And CEOs, like presidents, must handle the day-to-day -day execution of board policies and take direct responsibility for the persons who administer those policies. At the same time, in optimal constitutional structure, Epstein points out the relevant differences between these organizations. He notes, for example, that corporations have more internal coherence and less diversity, right? They're, um, uh, political organizations, in his words, must include diverse territories and groups, which leads on average to higher levels of heterogeneity and preferences, and there are also less costly exit rights in the corporate context, right? If you're unhappy, you can just sell your shares, right? Whereas emigrating from a country is, is much more costly. What are the implications of these differences? Um, Epstein, uh, Richard says, you know, when these exit rights are weak, substitute procedures and protections have to be strengthened. So he approvably notes, we have one person, uh, approvingly notes that we have one person, one vote, 
rather than more property-based um, notions of one share, one vote in the corporate context. And um, he also notes, very interestingly, uh, that uh, chief executive um, officers, unlike the president, serve at the will of the legislature-like board of directors. And in this sense, corporate governance is more parliamentarian than the American presidency, thus inspiring kind of this idea that comparative constitutional law might have something to tell us about agency constitutions. And then, importantly, Richard also um, notes that optimal constitutional structure depends heavily on the size and the shape of a particular polity. In his words, as internal um, disagreement in that polity and the scale of that polity increases, uh, the more important it is for a governing um, organizational constitution to be classically liberal. So how might we apply um, Richard's insights to this interpretive conundrum in what I'm calling the intra-agency separation of powers. Well, it's first worth observing, perhaps, that administrative agencies share features of both public and private organizations, at least as I've um, uh, described them. Um, and on the one hand, of course, they, organ they exercise public power. Of course, they are governmental entities. But at the same time, they are more internally coherent. Right? Their missions, statutory missions, are much narrower than uh, the project of trying to design a constitution for an entire nation. Um, and the first um, implication and um, uh, insight from, from Richard is to, to apply general corporate common law principles um, under these chief executive officer statutes. So what would that look like? Well, the majority of the board has the, should have the final say in resolving disputes over the scope of their own oversight authority, just as it does in the corporate context. The, uh, in other words, the chairman should be subordinate to the board, just as CEOs are subordinate to their boards. And um, the chair here, therefore, did not have the ability unilaterally to set the agency's budget um, or make investigations decisions, because when the chair and the commissioners disagree, the chair must be subject to the board's final decision. And um, in, in a nod to Richard's invitation to get out of our silos, um, that basically exhausts my knowledge of corporate common law. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a result, um, Tony Casey and I here are organizing a conference next fall about this intersection between corporate and political executive power, where I hope to learn more and hope to um, help foster uh, more um, discourse across these disciplines. <coughs> Finally, um, I will um, sort of puzzle about the, this other category of what might be inherent executive or administrative authority for these chairs in these chief executive officer positions um, with reference to Richard's insights. So the first is because um, the more internal disagreement and the larger the scale of the enterprise, the more important it is for the organizational constitution to be classically liberal. Perhaps um, agencies with partisan balancing requirements um, or greater power, so say they have more rulemaking authority under broader statutory authorities like the FCC, which is famously often in Richard's lights, um, uh, it might imply that chairs should have more uh, be more, not less, constrained by their boards. This constraint would serve to prevent these agencies from entrenching on private property rights. And secondly, in the classical liberal constitution, Richard is very skeptical of the constitutional prominence of these independent agencies in the first place. Right? He says, you know, Humphrey's executor, quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial. You know, these are made-up words. Whenever we have made-up words, something funny is something funny is afoot. <laughs> And these are not terms <coughs> of the Constitution. So he therefore proposes to strip independent agencies of their adjudicatory functions. In other words, whatever you want to say about rulemaking, post-New Deal, right? Certainly when we're talking about uh, adjudication, particularly of, of, of historically protected common law rights, we don't want independent agencies doing that. So accordingly, um, another uh, implication of that could be that indeed when uh, you have an agency, unlike the chemical safety and hazardous investigation board that does engage in um, adjudicatory functions, um, there too uh, we might want to constrain the executive more by the board. And then finally I'll just end with this, um, this, this observation um, uh, that Richard makes about the debate in the corporate context as to whether to fuse chief executive officers with the chairs of the board 
So the idea, as I understand it, is um, you usually want chairs of boards to serve more um, concilia a more conciliatory function, right, and try to get consensus from the board. Whereas if you have a separate chief executive officer, you can maintain that separation. But of course, if you fuse those in a more unitary um, executive, then you can have more energetic action, right, more quick implementation, and all the other ideas that you usually associate with the unitary executive. So to conclude by taking a step back, um, in observing Richard's just remarkable ability to generalize across law and institutions, um, I'll go out on a limb, because after all, it's always dangerous to interpret anybody's text through uh, authorial biography. But I also say that I suspect that uh, many of Richard's instincts stem at root from his own intellectual humility and some of his experiences as an organizational leader and executive. Indeed, as we heard Richard say at lunch, uh, often the best institutional leaders are those that recognize the limits of their own knowledge and experience. And when decision-making power is coupled with coercive governmental <coughs> power, well, it's little surprise that he thinks that the kinds of rights uh, that, that, constitutionally, that the Constitution must protect um, should be in a classically liberal form. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's, um, if I get this right the first time, they <coughs> might deny me tenure. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Uh, let's start talking a little bit. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, it's so great to be here. It's an honor. And uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, like most others in the room, I'm also here because of Richard's tremendous kindness and generosity. Uh, also, I have a slightly different take on Richard's work. I think he's one of the most keen um, um, sort of scholars of constitutional change. But I would also add that he's an excellent public choice theorist. So we've all been talking about how prolific Richard is and how many different areas of law he's written about. Uh, but he definitely has a public choice analytical lens. And that is sort of, uh, uh, that's been a big influence in my work. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to specifically talk about a peculiar provision in the Indian constitution called the Ninth Schedule. Uh, I chose this for a couple of reasons. One, to just show how universally applicable the Epstein School of Law is. Uh, and it's not just about uh, the American constitution or the areas of law right here in the US, but a lot of these principles can be used to design and better other systems across the world. The second is this is the kind of annoying rule that is uh, certain to drive Richard crazy, and one should never waste that opportunity. <laughs> um, so, Do I? Okay. Um, Richard, through his work, has demonstrated in various iterations how the independent judiciary in the United States has failed to has failed to uh, block any kind of not any kind of but a lot of rent seeking and interest group activity. Uh, so I want to. So to flip the question on its head and ask what would happen in the ideal Epstein world. So what would a world look like if interest groups were actually blocked by an independent judiciary? How would interest groups respond if an independent judi judiciary successfully blocked their rent-seeking attempts? So that's the starting point of my analysis. And uh, most economists don't ask this question because they tend to assume constitutional rules as given. They don't think too keenly about constitutional change, so the question is sort of moot. This activity wouldn't take place once uh, this kind of interest group activity is blocked and called unconstitutional. It just wouldn't happen. Lawyers have uh, studied this in much greater detail, and they understand that it sort of vaguely looks like this. So if interest groups' uh, efforts are deemed unconstitutional, they have a few choices. One, they can abandon the legislation or the effort. Or they can actually try to change the Constitution, which we see rather frequently. And how can one change the Constitution? You can go for a legislative amendment where you actually change the text of the Constitution. 
or you can change the meaning of the Constitution, usually through judicial interpretation. And Richard's work has focused a fair bit on the latter. Now, just to give a very typical Richard example, uh, take the takings clause. Uh, you have the public use, uh, the phrase public use has been reinterpreted and broadened over the years, and Richard has written a great deal about it. Another way to deal with it would be the way it uh, played out in India. Uh, another way to deal with it is the way it played out in India, which is they actually formally changed the text of the Constitution to deal with takings problems. So in 1950, when India got a newly minted Constitution, India also wanted to do large-scale socialist land reform and, comp and in the process not pay just and equal compensation. So consequently, they ran into a lot of trouble with the court. The courts, the courts, as Richard would be happy to note, actually actively block this kind of rent seeking and wealth transferring legislation. And uh, so, what was the outcome? In this particular instance in India, they decided that instead of abandoning the legislation, they would actually abandon the constitution or rather change the constitution. So, they created one of the most remarkable provisions uh, that I have seen in any constitution. Uh, this particular provision is called the Ninth Schedule. It took place in the First Amendment in 1951. This is the head note before the amendment. And it says the validity of these you know, land reform measures have been delayed due to litigation. So it is essential to amend the Constitution for securing the constitutional validity. So it's unconstitutional, so let's change the Constitution and make this constitutional is what they're saying in effect, right? Uh, there weren't too many limits, so this particular provision, the Ninth Schedule, it's a list of uh, statutes. Any law that is added to the Ninth Schedule is completely protected from judicial review, even if it violates the fundamental rights, which is sort of like the Bill of Rights of the American Constitution. Legislation can be added to this particular draconian schedule through constitutional amendment, but more than one law can be added in an amendment. So sometimes you've had 64 laws added in a single constitutional amendment. And uh, it's kind of unique. I think the only other parallel I have seen in any other constitution is the notwithstanding clause, uh, uh, clause 33 of the American uh, constitution, uh, of the Canadian constitution, which Richard has obviously written about. Uh, the original, uh, the original, uh, intention was to limit this particular uh, provision. And this is uh, Prime Minister Nehru, who was the architect of this particular amendment, and he recognizes that it's a very, very broad power that's been given to Parliament to sort of override independent judicial review. He says it's not with any great satisfaction we've produced this list. We don't want to make it long. Uh, we're, in the First Amendment, they only added seven individual statutes, and we would like to keep it that way and only deal with land reform problems. As you can imagine, uh, since this is the University of Chicago, there are many, many public choice theorists here. Uh, everything and the kitchen sink landed in the schedule. Uh, today, there are 282 individual pieces of legislation that are protected from independent judicial review, specifically for violating fundamental rights, because nothing ever gets added when it didn't violate fundamental rights. So, this is the situation that we're in with respect to the ninth schedule. Now, uh, just to give you some detail on what is actually in this schedule. Uh, so, a big chunk of it is land. Uh, so, all the columns uh, reflect what kind of statutes were added. So, there are basically two broad kinds, wealth transferring, which is the land redistribution and the nationalization of various sectors and firms and rent-seeking laws, which is basically tenancy and rent regulation and all kinds of price and quantity controls. So there were lots and lots of statutes because during this period, India was a mixed economy, mostly socialist leaning. So you have a lot of tenancy, re regulation, reform, price control, so on and so forth. If you look at this uh, table a little carefully, you will see that there are three trends. First, that the ninth schedule expanded well beyond Prime Minister Nehru's original vision to include 282 individual laws. Second, that it sort of slows down post-1978. Uh, and third, no laws have been added since 1995. So this is a little peculiar. If this provision is as broad as it is, why didn't it just endlessly expand? Why is there a slowdown and an eventual dormancy uh, with respect to the 1970s? 
So to answer this question, I essentially, uh, this is a perfect place because uh, the rest of the analysis is a rational choice analysis. So the Chicago School of Law is, is the perfect place uh, uh, to talk about this. What I create is a decision theoretic framework from the point of view of an interest group. So what is an individual interest group or a political entrepreneur thinking, or what are they analyzing in terms of costs and benefits when they try to figure out whether they should pursue unconstitutional legislation or whether they should abandon it? Uh, the advantage of doing this with the ninth schedule as opposed to any garden variety constitutional amendment is that those tend to be complicated with various interests. The ninth schedule is simple. You can look at one. Uh, uh, legislation at a time, so there are 282 individual pieces of rent-seeking attempts that landed in this particular schedule, so that makes it particularly good for this kind of analysis. So this is just a simple decision tree for an interest group. So an interest group that is, that's been blocked by a lower court uh, for, you know, its statute or a particular provision of the statute has been deemed unconstitutional, has three choices. Uh, they can either abandon the unconstitutional legislation and walk away uh, from the sunk costs. Second, they can amend the constitution. And third, they can appeal to a higher court. For the sake of simplicity, where I, I uh, assume this is the final appeal. Uh, but if you wanted to include, include more um, levels of appeals, you could just make this tree a little bit longer. And, and it's the same result. So if they do appeal to the judiciary, uh, there's a probability R that the judiciary uh, will uh, hold that particular statute constitutional, and therefore a probability 1 minus R that the judiciary will strike down that particular statute. Right? If they uphold it, then the payoff is delta, and all is well for the interest group. If they actually strike it down, once again, the interest group has two choices. It can, at the second stage, abandon the um, benefits arising from this particular unconstitutional statute, or it can then pursue constitutional amendment, right? Uh, so this is just generally all the Greek letters are describing the net, uh, the net present value of the expected benefits or the payoffs for each of these options. So now, uh, in this particular instance, everything sort of depends on what the interest group thinks is the probability of upholding or striking down the constitution. So to couch it in those terms, I've just, I'm describing a threshold at this point. So we just define the threshold. It, it's an arbitrary definition. So we just say R star, which is the probability that the court will uphold the law, is this, right? Uh, what we find is for any R greater than R star, the, it is beneficial for the interest group to appeal the legislation. Right, and actually go to court and try to reinterpret the Constitution. For any R less than R star, it should either am amend the Constitution formally or it should abandon. And uh, the choice to amend or abandon depends on the payoffs. Uh, if um, gamma is greater than beta, you should amend. If gamma is less than beta, you should abandon, which you see the gamma and beta are the payoffs for abandon and amend. So now, what about the ninth schedule? In, in the ninth schedule, we can think about, especially when we're trying to describe the dormancy and the eventual, um, the slowdown and the eventual dormancy of the ninth schedule, we need to think about what is R? Is R changing? Is the probability of holding the law constitutional or striking it down, is that changing over those five decades? The second thing to think about is, are there any additional costs and benefits imposed on interest groups for amending the constitution or abandoning the legislation? And we find both of these uh, to play an important role. So one of the important factors is, in 1978, uh, Parliament decides to just delete the takings clause. And so a lot of the property rights problems are resolved right there. Consequently, R will increase. That is, the probability of any law being held constitutional immediately goes up. So post-1978, you should see a slowdown in the ninth schedule because now there's a greater probability that laws will be held constitutional, so you don't need to put in the ninth schedule in the first place. But they only deleted the takings clause, thankfully. Some of the other fundamental rights were still intact. However, in 1981, you find, you find in a particular case called the Vaman Rao case, and I'm happy to talk about this more in Q&A, that uh, uh, in that particular case, they find that ninth schedule can actually be open to judicial scrutiny. 
1973, there was a very important doctrine in Indian constitutional law called the Basic Structure Doctrine, which talks about how, and, and Tom Ginsburg is here and he's written about this and the Ninth Schedule, uh, which essentially talks about how the Supreme Court can invalidate constitutional amendments. So in 1981, they actually applied the Basic Structure Doctrine to the Ninth Schedule and said, you know what, we can invalidate uh, constitutional amendments, including amendments where the Ninth Schedule is involved. So what we find is the procedural costs of amending the constitution go up, which means gamma, the net payoff, should go down, and R goes up, right? Between these two, what you would expect is fewer and fewer additions to the ninth schedule. Now, the 1981 case was incidentally upheld in, 19, in 2007 in a case called I.R. Coelho. So by 2007, you should expect a complete slowdown of these cases. So now, it's almost as if you would write it this way. Uh, that's the exact trend that you find uh, with ninth schedule legislation. So uh, the blue bubbles are all constitutional amendments uh, where laws are added to the ninth schedule before 1981. The green bubbles are after 1981. The size of the bubble depends on how many laws were included in a, uh, added in a particular constitutional amendment. So one particular amendment added 64 laws. One of them added only two laws. So the size of the bubble uh, tells you that. And uh, the brown line is the fitted values, non-weighted fitted values for the overall trend. So what you see is from 1950 to 1981, there's an increasing trend in adding laws to the ninth schedule, right? Exactly as you would uh, predict based on the case law and how it played out. From 1981 to 2007, rather 1997 and eventually 2007, because the case went on for 10 years, uh, you would expect a slowdown, which is what you see with the green line. And the good news is that the brown line is, you know, slightly decreasing. So overall, there are fewer and fewer additions to the ninth schedule as time goes by. So what does this tell us? There, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The bad news is that even if an independent judiciary successfully checks uh, uh, rent-seeking efforts by interest groups, they will just switch the forum where they lobby, right? So if the judiciary is particularly strict in its scrutiny and very costly, you just switch the forum to constitutional amendments. And that's bad news. Similarly, if you have very strong entrenchment of constitutions, that is, you make it very difficult to amend the procedure, as you have with the federal constitution of the United States, all the lobbying efforts will switch to, switch to the judiciary uh, to amend the constitution by interpretation, which is exactly what you expect, right? And in an ideal world, you would want interest groups to abandon their efforts, and the only way to do that is to make it procedurally costly to, to impose procedural costs that it actually makes it useful for them to abandon those efforts. And this brings me to the very end and the second theme that you see in Richard Epstein's work. Uh, this, I think, is extremely understudied because uh, Richard points out in various books, including the latest one, you know, the Oxford Handbook on uh, chapter on optimal constitutional structures, of how important the architecture of, this, of these structures is. And I think the ninth schedule really illustrates that. Uh, we need a particular kind of constitutional structure where the relative cost for interest groups or the relative benefits for interest groups from forum shopping between the legislature and the judiciary for constitutional amendments or constitutional interpretation should not be uh, too different because if it is, then you just divert the rent-seeking activity. You don't actually limit it. So uh, I think I'm out of time, and that's where I'll end. Okay, so far, uh, some of the presenters have, uh, you know, shown us uh, how your work, which has influenced their work. Uh, others have slightly disagreed with you. We will do neither, Mario and I. Uh, we will try to offer you new arguments, actually, for your distaste of behavioral law and economics. Um, let's see uh, how, how that plays out. And then Mario and I have the wonderful privilege uh, to close day one uh, with a presentation right before the reception. Uh, so in order to keep uh, the opportunity costs low for everybody in the room, uh, we will try to be concise, but also a little bit provocative. Um, 
So Richard has uh, written a number of articles uh, on methodological and normative questions of behavioral economics. Um, and just last week, he presented a very insightful paper at a conference on behavioral paternalism and the whole nudging debate in, in New York. Uh, and the title was Missing in Action, the Limited Role of Behavioral Economics in the Legislative and <coughs> Judicial Arenas. And the title gives you a slight idea uh, uh, what Richard's opinion on the matter is. Um, and um, it, for many years, I would say, Richard has now defended the idea of constant preferences against behavioral attacks. Uh, and this is, of course, one of the core assumptions in, in neoclassical economics. In his articles on behavioral economics, Richard has defended neoclassical economics against several of these attacks. Richard argues in favor of a rational choice account um, that is supplemented uh, by insights from evolutionary biology. And he's a big fan if I'm not mistaken, of the principle of inclusive fitness. Um, this leads me to our provocation. <coughs> in our paper, we gently challenge Richard's belief in constant preferences, at least to some degree. As we will see, it is only to some degree since any answer to the question of the true nature of preferences depends on the level of abstraction one chooses. If one defines preferences broadly enough, and for instance, equates them with our <coughs> innate biological desires, then it's quite hard to question their inherent stability. However, if one takes a more granular view and considers the, uh, the instrumental level of human problem solving, then preferences might be quite unstable, evolving, and open to trial and error learning. <coughs> and indeed, uh, Richard seems to acknowledge that instrumental preferences are a function of the individual's evolving stock of knowledge. Moreover, while Richard points out that individuals' dispositions and character traits are stable in the short term, they can vary with age and changes in life circumstances. This more dynamic understanding of instrumental preferences is also the view of the old Chicago School of Economics uh, that we will present in this paper. It is, we believe, a more nuanced view than the pure neoclassical understanding, and it is also much more nuanced than the one portrayed in behavioral economics, especially in its normative variant called behavioral welfare economics. So let's begin with a brief uh, recapitulation of the stickler becker model uh, while we're here in Chicago. So in this model, preferences are considered to be stable, largely context-independent, and to, uh, to a large extent also in invariant across people. And in their seminal paper of 1977, De Gustibus, uh, Stickler and Becker argue that this simple model is actually a very powerful model. Why? It allows uh, economists to explain any changes in individual behavior by changes in observable prices or income without any recourse to unobservable slight preferences. So over the last three decades, behavioral economics has opened the black box of the utility function and studied the nature of individual preferences. Based on experimental findings, uh, behavioral economists argue that the stickler becker model uh, of stable and invariant preferences is simplistic. For one, behavioral evidence suggests that preferences uh, can differ across people. For example, uh, you might observe substantial interpersonal variance with regard to self-interested motives, social motivation, or procedural concerns. Moreover, behavioral economists argue that our decision-making is often impaired by all kinds of psychological or contextual factors that produce inconsistent choice patterns. And those findings, especially about the inconsistent choice patterns, those findings pose a serious methodological challenge to the Stickelbecker model. If different frames that convey largely the same objective message to the decision-maker, uh, that is, choice options, prices, and income are equivalent uh, for all frames, if these frames produce different behavioral responses, it is not any more self-evident that an individual's behavioral changes are actually rational responses to changes in the constraints uh, the decision maker faces. And this particular challenge uh, uh, resulted uh, or stimulated the emergence of a new field uh, at the intersection of philosophy and economics and law called behavioral welfare economics. And Cass, Cass Sunstein is in law the, the biggest proponent of, of that account with his nudging agenda. And behavioral welfareists and Cass, Cass Sunstein <coughs> seem to believe that it's impossible to classify, uh, that it's possible to classify particular types of choices as decision mistakes when they do not reflect an agent's true preferences. And true preferences are those preferences 
that the agent would have acted on had her reasoning not been impaired by cognitive or emotional biases. And at the core of this program lies the idea that it's the task of the lawyer, the politician, or the economist to reconstruct the coherent subset of true preferences uh, whose satisfaction is con considered to be welfare increasing. And this approach has been uh, endorsed by many prominent behavioral economists, I mean Richard Taylor, uh, amongst others, and the overall policy program of nudging, as I mentioned. And in order to reconstruct those true preferences, behavioral welfareists take preference consistency as a normative criterion. So preferences that are intransitive do not belong to the set of true preferences. So while challenging the empirical validity of rationality axioms in describing human behavior, behavioral wealth economists take these axioms as the normative benchmark for good behavior. And this, what we call welfareist turn in behavioral e economics over the last uh, 20 years or 15 years, has been widely criticized. And here we don't want to provide an over overview of the critique. Rather, we would like to illustrate how a reassessment of the insights of the old Chicago School of uh, Economics can provide us with actually quite uh, good arguments against this uh, welfareist terms. Frank Knight and James Buchanan. Uh, so Frank Knight, uh, a teacher here, uh, a professor here in the Econ Department, and James Buchanan as a student whom we regard as the most important proponents of Old Chicago, present an original understanding of choice that circles around the notion of individuals as aspiring and becoming beings. Knight and Buchanan seek to investigate the consequence of individuals' inbuilt desire to modify their own preference set. And I quote Buchanan, that's man's tendency to want to become a better man. This inbuilt desire to strive for better ones leads to an unsettledness in human conduct. An end, an end once attained becomes the basis for further, better ends. In addition to this intentional dynamism, Knight and Buchanan emphasize the element of uncertainty in the preference formation process. They argue that individuals form beliefs not only about future stages of the world, but also about their own preferences. And in light of uh, this uncertainty, individuals act exploratively, they often don't know yet what they want, and experimentally, they mostly learn through trial and error. Um, and Knight and Buchanan both develop a multi-layered understanding of the individual. According to them, we are biologically constrained beings uh, who solve problems on two levels. At the level of means and calculation, they call that the economic man, and at the high level of values, where individuals critically reason about their ends. That's the artifactual man. And at the moment of choice, the economic man uses means deliberately to realize ends which are given to the individual at that particular moment in time. However, before and after the moment of choice, individuals constantly regenerate new um, ends. And ultimately, individuals look beyond their preferences to purposes or values, and these are neither truly fixed but the outcome of thinking and social interaction. Values and purposes are not preferences or even meta preferences. They, they are pro or con attitudes. They are neither stable nor defined at the margin, at least not as long as they remain pure values. They can conflict with each other. Individuals continuously struggle to translate their messy set of values into realize, realizable preferences. So this understanding of decision making also casts doubt on the basic premise of behavioral wealth economics. Uh, that deep within we all have these allegedly true preferences. Uh, if we accept that revealed preferences at the moment of choice are the result and not the input of decision-making processes, then the notion of true preferences seems to be ontologically questionable. According to Knight and Buchanan, preferences do not exist independently from decision-making processes. Rather, they are the outcome of transient reflective equilibrium, of cognitive processes of mutual adjustment among general, often conflicting values, economic practical reasoning, and local circumstances at discrete moments in time. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mamalta did such a wonderful job that uh, I'm not going to say too much. I don't want to ruin the, uh, <laughs> the points. I have to say that uh, if you like. Give me the picture of Richard's paper yes. from the, um, the seminar. The <coughs> so Richard said, the limited role of behavioral economics in the legislative and judicial areas. And then he, he, he ends up by saying that uh, 
the reason why most debates over litigation regulation nor the, sub the subject of behavioral economics is that the domain has nothing to add. So I guess then the answer is the limited domain is nothing. Um, and I think um, we're, we're not quite saying that, but we're saying almost that. I think the big point that uh, if I would add uh, that we're trying to make is that um, the, pre the preferences are always in process. The, the, the creation, the construction, the discovery of preferences is, is, is always in process. And that uh, really then the place to look for rationality is not in uh, consistency of preferences and transitivity of preferences as behavioral economists view as the normative ideal, uh, but really to look at things that, as if they were uh, in a process of becoming. Um, this, um, there, there is plenty of evidence uh, now being collected that, that, uh, that this is true. Uh, Stigler once said of Frank Knight that uh, he made a lot of uh, empirical assumptions for which he didn't even have a cup full of evidence. So our second part of the, uh, the paper is the, is the cup full of evidence. But let me just say briefly um, that there is a, an important uh, uh, literature uh, uh, on, um, <clears throat> on, on, on preference uh, construction and preference uh, discovery. Uh, the idea simply is, uh, in the more moderate version, people are reflecting and discovering their preferences, which they only come to a sort of stable understanding over time and with experience of trying to implement uh, various lower-level instrumental preferences. Um, the, the constructed preference idea is more radical and says, in effect, there aren't necessarily preference down deep in, in a person that he's trying to, 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 con, to discover, but acting in the world, uh, we really construct our preferences and they tend to be temporary, at least at certain levels, uh, and, and, and therefore not to be expected uh, to be immune from uh, effect being affected by elicitation, elicitation processes or influence of other people or of um, various kinds of uh, framing or structures. And that doesn't mean that any of them are, are, are not true preferences. It just means that preferences aren't this thing that has this sort of immutable quality that we're all seeking to somehow manifest uh, in the world. That further doesn't mean that they ought not to be respected because human beings are really the sum of all the influences that they have, internal and external, and part of autonomy is to, uh, to re uh, respect real-world in in individuals uh, in the process of, uh, of becoming. And, and finally, I would like to say about errors. Uh, behavioral economics like to um, say that people are uh, subject to all sorts of systematic errors. Uh, but what Knight said, and what I think is absolutely true, is that errors are, are, are really crucial to learning. And simply because uh, we make errors doesn't mean that uh, uh, nothing good is coming of it. In fact, there are in psychology uh, certain experiments known as blocking experiments that indicate that unless people's expectations are disappointed, they tend not to learn at all. And so the systematic or persistent nature of, uh, of errors may be the case in aggregate data, but on an individual basis, uh, and the experiments of John Liss seem to indicate this, people do learn from their experience. Finally, uh, a point that, that Richard has made a number of times is that uh, people oftentimes make decisions not as individuals, the atomistic individuals, but in groups. Uh, and sometimes these groups are corporate groups or, or groups of friends or actually family uh, situations. And the evidence so far is rather impressive that uh, group decision making, small group decision making, either uh, unrelated people in groups or, or families, uh, in almost all of the cases where they test for these biases, Group decision makers make these biases in far lower numbers than uh, individuals alone in, a, in an experimental setting. So I think there's a lot uh, to be learned uh, about um, the, uh, the dynamic view of preferences that old Chicago had. And I think this is 
would be perfectly consistent with many of Richard's uh, suspicions about behavioral economics. This is the final lap, and let me hope that I don't lapse in the entire thing. First of all, I want to thank people for three very different kinds of speeches. Ten minutes? No, twelve. Thank you. <laughs> With this paper, I mean, the heterogeneity means you need more time than you do for the others, but they all kind of, in some sense, actually relate to one another. The question that the fundamental question that every legal system tries to ask is, given what we know about human nature, what kind of legal rules, what kind of institutions, what kinds of practices we have, which allow us to essentially make sure that the action of one person takes will not systematically result in greater harms to other individuals. And this is an extremely complicated thing to do. And it depends on the fact that when people engage in their individual self-interest, uh, the moral constraint against trespass by others is, to put it mildly, imperfect and not evenly distributed. Uh, so there are some people who, I think, go out of their way to be kind and nice and decent to other individuals. And if you get 10 of them, it's fine. But if you get somebody on the other side who's out to do other people in, the damage that one person can cause is far greater than the amount of good that any other individual can do, uh, given the ability to take over the reins of power and to use force one way or another. So everything that we're trying to do is to figure out how you set up a series of institutions to deal with the kinds of people we have. And in a sense, the papers sort of go in the opposite direction of standard phenomenology and so forth, in the sense that when Walter and Mario do, they're talking about the stuff of individuals. And it's when you look at that stuff of individuals, then you have to ask the question, what kind of institutions do you want to take? Uh, so on an immediate whim, what I'm going to do is talk about the paper in a slightly different order and begin with the preference structure uh, rather than the institutional arrangement. And I'm going to sort of prove the constancy of profession of, of, of preferences in terms of taste by noting that my tie is half adjusted and the top button is open. Uh, you can see pictures of Richard Epstein going back to the point where he was about 12 years old, and the tie is slightly akimbo, and the top button is always open. And no matter how many times my elegant wife, who's now in the room, has tried to correct me about this, this form of preference systematically reasserts itself. And it has done so over 50 years. If you want to look at other things in my deeply introspective self, my preferences for Mozart, say, over Bruckner have been consistent from the time I was very young. My preference is for staying away from asparagus, which by my count, my wife has eaten something like about 13,000 times, and I've eaten a grand total of zero times <laughs> over the situation. It shows a remarkable stability in the world of taste on these things. And in fact, I think that's true. There are a lot of people I know here for a very long period of time, and some for shorter time. And the thing in terms of preferences, dispositions, and so forth in the taste regime is that the remarkable constancy of people is the thing that you know rather than this constant situation. There is no question that there is certainly going to be change through learning and so forth, which is the things to which they referred. Uh, but in many cases, it turns out that uh, this is sort of means ends adjustment. Knowing what your tastes are and knowing what your competences are, what do you want to do? And it's also clear that when you're doing this, nobody wants to work this off of an individualist model because it simply does not comport uh, to the way you begin, <coughs> begin or carry on life. When you're a child, there are always influences from your parents and so forth. Uh, sometimes they nudge you in the nudge sense, but if you come from a Jewish family, they nudge is in the other sense of the word, in which they kind of push you a little bit too far, or one way or the other. And in fact, figuring out which kinds of nudges you want are appropriate. The process of socialization does not only involve nudges, it also involves certain cases brute force against certain kinds of activities that children are willing to commit against their neighbors. But this process of socialization is always going to be cooperative. And the old Freudian theory, which I've always loved, is what parents try to do is to internalize a set of viable norms in their children so when they're no longer subject to external constraint by a family, they internalize the norm and they behave in a perfectly appropriate fashion. Uh, so when I hear about people's changing preferences and all the rest of the stuff, uh, this is the way in which I think about it. I think individual tastes tend to be remarkably constant in that sense, uh, but that the learning tends to take place on the more on the means ends question. And then as new opportunities open up, the ends themselves come into play. Uh, but what I really kind of fight up against 
is to some extent I'm saying, well, I'm not just the person that I was, and there's no relationship between the Epstein of 2018 and the Epstein of 1950. I think these are much tighter connections, and it's only if you have that continuity of personality that you could actually have a sensible theory of, of responsibility. If somebody says, oh, somebody else who did that 40 minutes ago, it's not me, well, you can't punish the guy who's disappeared into cyberspace, uh, and you can't punish me, we don't believe that. What we do is we think that there's enough continuity of personality that allows us to talk about stability. And then when the changes start to come, it turns out that it has something to do with taste, more to do with learning, and things of that particular sort. Uh, so a model which essentially tries to make these things more capricious is a model which essentially, I think, is false to the way in which folks go. Now, as I mentioned, I think this is awfully important because if you have a kind of a very uh, kind of gooey view of the way personalities run, it becomes very difficult to know how you get a stable set of legal rules for a set of unstable people. And there are two alternatives. One is that you can't do it, at which point you degenerate into the law of all against all. Or the other thing, which I think is deeply troublesome about behavioral economics, is somehow the guys who talk about the frailties of everybody else seem to think that in part, part they're immune from those things, so that they're the folks who ought to take the exalted position in telling other people how they ought to run their lives. And in fact, Richard Thalen, one of the dumbest statements ever made on this particular subject, when he's defining paternalism, says, if you seek advice, essentially you can see that paternalism is there. That's not true. Parents exercise force over people. Advice people don't do it. And as Mario and Malta said, taking advice is an essential part, not of a paternalist regime, but of effectively a socialization regime. And indeed, one of the reasons why the world works as well as it does, most people learn in some way or another to do what we call listen to reason, i.e. they can be persuaded that particular forms of action are nutty. So I certainly believe that there are warped people who cannot listen to anything. But socialization is, I think, a powerful force. And if you look at behavioral economics, there's no discussion of that in any serious way. It's just a bunch of kind of strange tests about mugs and so forth and temporal preferences without talking about that. Now, when you do this, you then have two kinds of restraints that you have to deal with. And one of them is the Jennifer New restraints, and the other is the Shruti Rajagopal, and I can pronounce it after eight years. Um, and one of them is how you organize institutions, and the other is how you organize fundamental rights. And both of them are essentially asking the fundamental question of how it is when we deal with individual behaviors and choices that we try to align the behavior of any given individual in any position uh, with the social welfare of a larger community of which they're a part. And governance structures and private corporations uh, start with the assumption that there's always conflicts of interest that take place between a CEO, a board of directors, shareholders, and so forth. And then the question is, what kind of devices do we use? One of them which was not mentioned is, if you try to create identical share interests that are perfectly fungible one to another, it turns out it's a lot easier to organize voting and collective mechanism than if every person has a discrete and separate interest which cannot be weighed and counted. So fungibility is an extremely important device for control. You then have to have voting rules and so forth, and there's always the great trade-off as to how these ought to run. And it turns out, generally speaking, for fundamental decisions, majority rule is too weak, uh, but unanimity is too strong, and so we tend to develop a tradition of supermajorities. The question as to what thing is done by board and administrators, the basic rule, which I think Jennifer referred to, which is surely correct, is the CEO, in effect, can make day-to-day -day decisions, but structural changes, selling the company, getting rid of a major distribution, and so forth, are generally done by larger amounts. There are other constraints on boards. The doctrine of ultra-virus says, we limit the kinds of things that you can do because when investors decide to invest in you, uh, they want to have some sense as to the space in which you're going to occupy. It makes it easier to figure out the one company. And look, she didn't mention it. Corporations are easier also because you could diversify a portfolio. I can't diversify a portfolio of people who govern my particular life. And so the theory that she has said is exactly right, is that when you start looking at these governance structures, to the extent that exit rights are cheap and a form of discipline, uh, you can be a little bit more relaxed with respect to the voting rights and the property protection rights. To the extent that exit rights are not that way, you need a much stronger seats of protection. So Vicki Bean wrote a very famous paper in 1991 about exit rights as protecting property rights. And I just asked her the question, I said, uh, two things. One, you can't exit with land, so is the exit right theory going to work? 
for them, it might work for the developers. And also, if in fact you do run an exit right and there's no kind of protection, uh, you protect the exit right. Or is that going to be subject to various kinds of limitations? And under current law, the answer to that question seems to be no. Uh, you could constitutionally squash the exit right, at which point the mechanism starts to break down. And that sort of gets us to the other part of this thing, uh, which is how the taking stuff starts to work. Now, it works both within organizations on the one hand and across organizations on the other. So if you start to look at every kind of private governance structure, what you do is you discover invariably uh, two kinds of rules, a business judgment rule and a fair value rule. And the basic line between them is on business judgment cases, there's no conflict of interest. If you make sure that people are only going to be protected when they make the right decisions, nobody's going to take the job. And so you're going to find yourself in just a terrible mess of getting good people to serve. On the other hand, if you follow an anything goes structure, things are going to be very, very terrible. Uh, so what you do is you put into place various kinds of processes and procedures which are designed essentially to improve the odds that these people are going to make the right kind of decision. And these tend to be procedurally based, got to have some degree of deliberation and so forth, and substantively based to the extent that you at least require people who are in favor of a particular program to indicate why they're in favor of it and forget something else. What you don't do in this system is if they put things on both sides of the scale, you as a judge do not try to weigh the strength of those two particular instances on the grounds that they have better information about this choice than you do, and other informal constraints will work. Uh, so this is certainly a constraint, but it's not a powerful one. Introduce a conflict of interest, and it turns out that you get yourself into exactly the opposite position. And now you know that the way in which you could profit is to dump corporate assets into the hands of some private individual. Uh, so the scrutiny is far higher when we start talking about fair value. It turns out that this is exactly what we do with the public trust doctrine, uh, when it turns out you have to have management responsibilities with respect to various kinds of government behaviors. And so if you put a river in public trust, uh, uh, Bill Pryor had to leave because he didn't want to hear anything more about Roman law. Um, <laughs> what essentially happens is uh, there are two kinds of duties that emerge, and Tom has traced this out. Uh, you have duties of loyalty that you have to do. You can't basically treat your public trust as a benefit for some size situation. And you have to show some moderate degree of competence. And then the real question is, do you have a prohibition on alienation? And probably that's going to be a mistake if, in fact, you can have a fair value rule uh, when there are conflicts of interest. So these things essentially kind of emerge. And the takings law that, that Shruti referred to gives you exactly the same thing. The general proposition, before I stop, is as follows. If you want to figure out what the per se no-no is with respect to the takings, is thou shalt not, as a government, convert a competitive market into a monopolistic one. We don't, under these circumstances, have to figure out exactly who's going to win and who's going to lose. Because what we know is, is if you shrink the pie, there are necessarily going to be some losers whose losses are going to exceed the gains from other individuals. If the regulation is, as I believe it is generally a taking when it limits your right to dispose it, to use beyond the law of nuisance, uh, then we know what the property is lost, and we know that the compensation is insufficient. So why does this render the New Deal unconstitutional? Um, well, I mean, this is, this is not just a kind of idle speculation. It's that the entire system is essentially one which was designed to displace competitive institutions with monopolistic ones. Uh, that was with respect to the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which right, with Michael talked about this morning. It's certainly true of the Motor Vehicle Act, with the Civil Aeronautics Act, uh, with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, all of the kinds of exemptions from cartelization are easy things to strike down. On the other hand, if you're trying to figure out what you do when you have a natural monopoly, and to figure out how you regulate it, then you can have genuine disagreements of opinion that really matter. Uh, do we use one standard, i.e., uh, the standard of Smith v. Ames, that it has to be used and usable, or do we use Hope Natural Gas, where you don't care how they use it, you just care about the amount of investment? There's much more discretion in there. And essentially what Shruti has been able to point out, I think, in this paper, is that the reason you're so worried about this is bad guys don't rest just as good guys don't rest. If you try to shut them off from one way of doing business, they will happily find another way in which to do this stuff. And so the bottom line with respect to this is uh, that you divide the world into two classes of cases. Those which essentially interpret regulation 
or common law rules are designed to control force, fraud, or monopoly, and you sort of worry about whether or not the means are adjusted to the ends. And then you look at the modern progressive issue, which I've been fighting for my entire academic career, and you never let a system decide to run it in reverse and find funny regulations to say, we're going to justify monopolization, given the fact that there is a systematic welfare law, unless you can find something which is did. Diane, when she talked about this in the last time, she said, one thing to talk about a patent, which gives you a monopoly over a piece of paper or something, and it's another thing to control a monopoly over a market. Uh, so when you're looking at patent laws and so forth, it turns out the right result is when people start to combine patents, if it's vertical integration, generally good. Horizontal integration, generally bad. And at one time, we actually reached that result. And on that optimistic note, I'm going to say thank you. Jennifer, do you want to respond to that? Elaborate? No, Trudy? Open. Okay. Uh, all right, it's open. Field is open. Floor is open. Yes. Um, so my question, I guess, is about the chair model, which is really interesting to think about the internal agencies. And I guess it's for either of you, but the mm -hmm. idea would be thinking about who's the principal for the agency overall, whether it's the president or whether it's Congress. Because I can imagine conceptualizing that question and saying, OK, we'll give the chair more power if we really think the principal is the president, because we know the president is picking the chair, mm -hmm. and that allows the president to get his preferences enacted, and that brings accountability to the people. On the other hand, if you think the agency is really supposed to be answering to Congress, you might want it to be a full board decision because that's going to be their both parties are going to have their signalers in the agency. And so I'm just kind of curious how you conceptualize this as opposed to the corporate context where you have two potential principles there and they might not have the same interests. Yeah, so um, looking at the legislative history of some of these statutes, um, a lot of them came out of presidential efforts. So I'm thinking, for example, of the Hoover Commission, the Brownlow Commission, and these statutes, particularly the Reorganization Acts, were really a product of you know, a strong president attempting to centralize authority um, in the chair and resulting in these kinds of you know, um, you know, uni unitary executive kinds of um, clauses in these constitutions. So, you know, one way to think about it is, you know, without taking it too seriously, like an originalist sort of understanding of this constitution, um, it is that uh, they are meant to, the chairs are meant to be agents of the president. And, um, and, they, and, then, and, and the framers very much had that in mind. And it was a sense that the independent agencies had gone awry and were too untethered from the executive branch that they really tried to empower the chairs. But I mean, like, who's the agency an agent of? So the chair is an agent of the president, but the agency, the whole commission, who are they supposed to be serving? Oh, yeah. The president? <coughs> yeah, well, I mean, so, I mean, it's, 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 you know more than that, isn't it? That's, 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 yeah. that's a difficult question. I mean, I think, yeah. well, Typically, it's yes. a public interest mandate, right, that they're supposed to be pursuing. Well, yeah, but the question is, is like, who is the right agent of the public, right? And so, of course, traditionally, right, I, I, the easy answer is to say, as a doctrinal matter, I think a lot of people do think of the independent agencies as more serving Congress, and therefore, I think that is, in part, what motivated, again, the unitary executive models, because there was an effort to pull that, right. that effort back from Congress into the hands of the president. Um, and I think that's right. I mean, I think that's why, you know, the, the, that's why these independent agencies are often structured yeah, where they are. Maybe I have some different answers. Um, uh, this relates to some of the discussions we've been having. I think when you actually create a genuine independent agency where people serve fixed terms and they can only be removed for court, that agency is answerable to no essentially. Um, and so what you're trying to do then is to treat it like a corporation which is formed by a shareholder and figuring out what goes on. If there is an independent agency like that, and neither the president nor the Congress can exercise any effective control over it, uh, you then have the choice of the parliamentary model or the presidential model. If you take a presidential model and teach the CEO outside of the organization, you necessarily have to limit the scope of the activities. But you can't get rid of that guy by a vote of confidence, so it's going to be an impeachment. If, on the other hand, you take the parliamentary model, which we projected, the way in which the system gets put together, the prime minister is exactly what the word said. Five first, right? Primus and departs. First amongst equal. And so at that point, um, he has a more distributed set of powers. He's not subject to impeachment, but he is subject to being removed to some extent by a vote of confidence, one kind or of another. That's on the private side. The difficulty on the public side 
is that these characters may well be entrenched in a way that they're not, and they're also divided politically <coughs> along very sharp lines. And so the idea that each of them is an independent fiduciary is compromised by the fact that each of them is a member of a particular party. So one of the suggestions that came out this morning, I, which I strongly endorse, is I don't think the difference between independent and non-independent agencies matters that much on rulemaking and stuff. But boy, oh boy, I think it is flatly wrong to ever allow an organization which is appointed by political affiliation to be given an adjudicated fund. And so I, and I don't see there's any real retrospective problem that prevents that from being reversed. So I would <coughs> put the functions up. And when you do that, have rotating judges say on specialized courts, one way or another, even with life tenure, I don't care about that, you rotate it in and out, I think in effect you get a huge improvement over the system. And that what we've really done in the current system is we have too much amalgamation of powers in these kinds of agencies. And the danger of the word quasi when it was used uh, by Justice Sutherland, right, um, is that it essentially got ourselves into the position where these things became 900 pound rules and nothing should be that. And that's my response. Tom, um, we'll come back. Just a follow up to Rachel's question. So I think you mentioned that when these disputes arise between the chair and the board, that some of them are useful resolved by the Comptroller General. Well, my question is, who is supposed to resolve the dispute? So the Comptroller General is uh, thought to be a legislative officer. I'm sure the Unitarians would say the Office of Legal Counsel is supposed to resolve the disputes of the executive branch agency. And if it's true that the, the board perspective is pro-Congress and the chair perspective is pro-executive, the decision about who resolves the issue may, may determine the outcome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. One I try to address in the in the paper. So, um, so so I, I think the answer, I think the answer is um, the Office of Legal Counsel for the following reason. Because of this initial instinct that I had, um, you know, about the 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 um, the, the the mandate, the, the legislative history of, of these chair provisions. But um, more importantly, you know, just our understanding of you know the agencies. Um, traditionally as executive entities. Now, I have to, to think more about it. I will say that in the, the context of the, the Chemical Safety Board, as a matter of agency socialization, they certainly thought that OLC was the right body to resolve the question, and that's what happened in the case. The OLC did issue an opinion, um, basically adopting many of these corporate common law principles, and, um, and, and that's where they saw it. Um, one thing I will add is that um, whatever we think the right answer is, it is almost never a, an Article Three court. Um, well, so, yes, of course not. You know, right, right. Well, no, but I mean, you could imagine you could imagine a different situation where you know that um, some 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 third parties are able to show harm and they try to bring these suits. And there have been some attempts to do that, but they've been rejected. Yeah, well, I mean, that's exactly the problem. Um, what happens is the reason that there's no Article Three court is because the Constitution standing provisions have been mangled. Uh, we now have standing in the cases of law. We do not have standing in the cases of equity. Uh, essentially, the law side is discrete injury to a particular person, and nobody has that in these cases. But if you go back to the early history of equity courts, one of the things that they were supposed to do is to govern these collective organizations in which individual shareholders and members could sue an action on the grounds that it was all through virus. If they won, they could enjoin it. And since it was ultra virus, this is not a question of majority vote. Other people are willing to vote in on the power. This is a vested individual right. Uh, and if you were basically reverse product and melon on this particular point, and then if the charge is one that's ultra virus, uh, you would get a judicial resolution. If the charge is one of the merits of a particular dispute, it would immediately flip over to a business judgment rule type situation where I think that the judicial stuff would be, uh, would be essentially pointless or hopeless. And so I think, in effect, the reason that we're doing this the wrong way is that we have the wrong constitutional framework on this particular question. And the uh, starting with Rotherham and going all the way through the Scalia type opinions, we get standing systematically wrong. Uh, then it means that under the current tradition, we, we rule out Article Three. Uh, but for all the virus claims, I would move it back, back into power. Um, and we would then have the structure where these agencies are subject to that. You hive off of the agency, the, all of the adjudicated functions, 
Now, you do trim them back to size in two important ways, but you still allow them to do their works, and I think the mistakes and constitutional doctrines on both of these points. So that's what we mean by thinking globally. And if you remember in Frothing, what Justice Sutherland said is, well, I know municipal corporations are subject to open virus, right? but they're small, and we're low. And it says corporations are subject to open virus. Why it is that the size of an organization to determine whether or not an individual <coughs> member of that organization, citizen, shareholder, whatever, can sue, is something which he never explained. If anything, the bigger the organization, the more the coordination problem, and the more important it is to allow open virus attack to be made by just one person. But they got to be right. And then you have a hearing in which everybody has, can come in as interveners if, in fact, they disagree. So all the stuff on adjudication, which is built into standing incorrectly, now is built into the law of necessary and indispensable parties, which is exactly the way it does, was done in English equity courts in 1787. All that history has been completely forgotten. Can I just make one quick last observation? Just that quite quick. It's just I think that the constitutional metaphor um, helps to draw these analogies insofar as it, it, it imports all these debates about like departmentalism, like who has the final say. You know, I think that there are fights about whether it should be controller general policy that, that are evocative and reflect the fights in kind of the, the federal constitutional context. We have 10 minutes. I want to make sure we address some of the other, the other papers. Are you on any the other papers? Um, I'm on the paper. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, now that we've come to the end of the, the first day, there is like a common thing uh, I, I noticed two times the last time as well that Professor Epstein is a very consistent man in the sense that if I have your readings, they make you think of how you talk. There is some sort of symmetry between your reading and your speaking. There is a sort of symmetry also uh, between your opinions over time, and apparently your preferences are also very uh, consistent. So, in that sense, my advice, I thought your defense to the thesis, uh, Dold Windsor, was quite convincing. However, maybe if you want to attack the view that preferences are not stable, you don't want to take the most consistent man in the room, you want to take the least consistent man in the room. That's because. <laughs> if your thesis works then, then you certainly have an argument, right? I'll take this with respect to everybody. Okay. I mean, let me just tell you the story of my engagement, Benjamin's engagement with art. <laughs> in which we had a bunch of people who came to the party who had known for 40 years to we talk about constancy. So I gave Max Spitzer an award for being the person who was most well known by Eileen and me independently for the longest period of time. And so I knew him from Bert Eileen from 16, got less hair now, same guy. Real crowd pleaser. <laughs> <laughs> an extremely important geopolitical event in our family life, which is deeply remembered. But since you're in the room now, I can recall. I mean, I think, you know, that's true. I've known people in this room for 40 years. And basically, I would say, with respect to everybody here, continuity is essentially the dominant mode with organized systematic change. Can I jump in on that? I, I think only know I, for three years, so you can't <laughs> I think the question is if law professors at University of Chicago are representative of the sample population. And I thought, I, and some I, other and universities. Think, and, yeah, and I think you might be an exceptional group on many margins, and Richard, you yourself, is a singular Singular man. Okay. So I, I'm not sure how much of the personal experience well, I don't you have. Mario, for 40 years, he hasn't changed. That was, exactly, that was exactly my point. Whether okay. you're the perfect statistical okay. test okay. to debug the T. Mario, we're not addressing anecdotal evidence. Yeah. There is plenty of uh, evidence behavioral economists have produced about inconsistency and changes of preferences. Let me just mention three. One is that. Um, that uh, people uh, uh, sometimes make uh, co commitments to uh, diet or whatever, and then when it comes time to diet, they drop their commitment. They make their commitment again, they drop the commitment. That's one of the evidences of uh, changing preferences. Another, another evidence is that if we change the frame in which uh, the decision is made, people will make different, uh, different decisions. Uh, that sometimes uh, uh, for near-term decisions, people are can be can be very impatient for far term decisions. They can be very uh, patient. Uh, these are the kinds of instabilities of preferences and all that which behavioral economists in their experiments have uh, allegedly or supposedly demonstrated. What we're trying to say is that can be expected because there is a certain dynamic quality to 
people's preferences. And that's what we're getting at. I know I don't know how to fit in the Thai business with all of this, but I'm just addressing we're just addressing a particular scientific literature that indicates instability of preferences. Yeah, so, yeah, and yeah, and saying that it's not bad. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And if you would integrate this within the model, it wouldn't be a deviation from the model, so these guys wouldn't go so crazy to regulate everything. No, no, essentially what happens with guys and similar things to start or seems relatively low, well, you start using a large amount of ways in the early days. You go a little bit further, you get less of return, and all of a sudden it becomes more irritable, the lines cross and you switch. And then you indulge and you go through the cycle again. I don't think there's anything about that which is extraordinary. I mean, in the Epstein household diets come very often and they disappear very often. But there is an evolutionary feature which is extremely important which is if the body feels that the caloric stuff is going to be reduced, what you do is you change the metabolism and maybe slow it down. And so it becomes systematically harder to adjust. And that is one of the reasons why when you're actually doing this stuff, there are biological uh, constraints which help explain the cycle. This is using the evolution to help boost the result. In the back. Yes? Oh, I was going to ask a quick question to Richard. If I consistently break my dieting commitment, does that make me inconsistent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just being inconsistent. No, so. it's exactly right. I mean, that's why what happens is you have, you don't need paternalism, you go to Weight Watchers or some other thing. Yeah. And, and you start right. to see the number of diets that fail, but you then start to believe, and I think it's quite accurate, uh, that what's happened is you have an internal clock, everybody does, about weight. Uh, which starts to run, you then get to the government, and one of the things is they do the BMIs, the body mass indicators. One of the dumbest things that they do is they assume that these should be constantly garbage uh, Which cannot be, you can't think of the stupid thing. Uh, because essentially, generally speaking, as people start to get older, the metabolism starts to change, and the ratios of them start to change. So what you want to do is you want to normalize these things with respect to weight, ages. You can call it consistency if you want. The point about behavioral economics is that there was a, I'm just going to mention one thing. Um, Kahneman and Tversky and I were together at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science in the 1970s, 78. And when they were doing all this work on prospect, we had these epic struggles um, going back and forth about how all of these things were to work. There was a session on sociobiology going on about inclusive fitness and other things. And they never once attended any one of these sessions to figure out what it would do. And then when Thaler and Sunstein wrote up something about back of one of these eulogies in the New York, uh, they quoted Tversky, unfortunately, he was a great man, died in 1996. And what Tversky said about the evolutionary biologist is after you talk to them for a while, you don't believe in evolution. And the problem is, at no point do they incorporate any of that. So just the simple thing. If you're talking about any of these biases, if you treat everybody in the same way, you're ignoring a fundamental feature of black population biology, which is every trait you can mention has got a distribution. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you specialize, essentially, trade off where you are in the distributions with respect to the functions that you have. Um, and, and that's a serious problem. And that, they're not making that mistake. Multiple. Well, that, that's exactly, I think, the, the, the mystic, the nudging program does. Because they don't accept that we have the, that distribution, right? They basically assume we're all system two decision makers with uh, similar types of preferences, and they don't allow for that variation. It doesn't uh, help that they don't know what system one and system two are. That's a difference. Sunstein's on both sides of this, because on the he one changed, side there's yeah. nudge, but he's also got this literature on decision making and groups and how it yeah. has improved, and that's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Yes? I mean, it, it's a fundamental truth that great investors um, have this trait that when faced with new information, they will revise their choices. And this is one of the ways that um, hedge funds will screen for who will be a good trader or not. So the quality of being able to adjust your output in response to new inputs is, is fundamentally critical to you know successful decision making now. On the other hand, does that mean that you're an inconsistent person? Uh, not necessarily at all. I mean, you, people have internal algorithms of choice through which they decide is the, the answer to any given question. And so while we make different answers in response to different situations, that doesn't necessarily mean we're really coming up with uh, different preferences at the end of the day. 
figuring out what those substances are um, would require mapping someone's internal algorithm of, uh, of hierarchical choices. Um, and, and that's just extremely complex. And I don't think that anyone's really done that very well. Um, um, but what my takeaway from all that is never listen to what people say they want. Only listen to the choices they make and what they actually do. Um, and I think that that principle can be very helpful in, in trying to figure out how to make use of the fact that people um, uh, come to different answers to different questions and, and, and when to listen to what they, what they reveal as their preferences or not. Amen. One more? So, uh, so just a couple of suggestions uh, with respect to the behavioral economics stuff. Uh, with respect to framing, there have now been some new uh, works published, particularly Plot and Zeiler, yeah. have uh, yeah. uh, very good pair of pieces basically showing the great fragility of some of the willingness to pay versus willing to accept stuff. Betsy Hoffman with some co-authors has published a piece showing that the classic preference reversal stuff turns out to be a lack of training and a lack of understanding on the part of subjects. And, and third, with respect to the Knightian, uh, if you will, model of preferences and choice, there's, there's now a substantial uh, literature by uh, psychobiologists using fMRI studies in which the blood flow yeah. results turns out to track closely certain types of statistical probability functions, particularly logistic. Uh, functions, and so it looks like we have something that looks like a logistic uh, function inside our heads, and so if that's true, that would be the sort of preference, if you will, but the choices you shouldn't expect to be completely consistent, and when the options get close enough together, you should you should flip almost to the 50% rate. Yeah, there's also, one of the papers that was given about by a fellow named McKenzie and Company, and what he said is, oftentimes if you take two things which look to be virtually equivalent, they are, given their social context, actually distinguishable. So the example he gave is you talk about a glass being half full or half empty. A lot of it depends upon what the glass was before with either one of these two states. And you will look at it in a different way. You're trying to figure out how rapidly people drink, and you're willing to look at it the other way in terms of how rapidly some people is going to fill in there. So it turns out that these things are not equivalent. Uh, what happens is they're eliciting different stresses and different kinds of information, uh, so that when people respond to difference in frames, the implication is it's not that there's a, an intellectual equivalence. So which they're giving them consistent. different information. Is it turns out that there's some information. But the single biggest argument against all this silly stuff on default is when the university gives you a default rule, it's a recommendation, and you don't just treat it as a random number. And so therefore, you tend to follow it, particularly when you're a low information person. And what happened is, one of the other things that is, if you look at rules, the problem about disclosure rules is they give you a general tendency, but they don't tailor it to individuals. And so any effective program will combine a disclosure rule with an advice function, where the former sets out the basic parameters, and then the latter essentially starts to allow you to individually tailor. That's exactly, for example, what you want to do with medical warnings, right? This is the basic frame, and you better speak to your physician. And so if you think of these as two-stage processes, a lot of the purported irrationality disappears. Disappears is the last word. Curse <laughs> <laughs> as far as the reception. The reception is of the library upstairs. You can uh, reach the library by taking the stairs past the uh, reception desk, or there's an elevator upstairs. Okay. Before we do that, let's thank this panel.